Hello everyone and thank you for joining. My name is Brittany and I want to welcome you all to the Server Virtualization Tech Showcase. First, we'll talk about a couple optimization tools. Then I'll introduce our speaker, Charlie Hill, and he'll take over and give his presentation. We will then have Gary Ballantyne talk about QuickStart and so show some of our virtualization classes. And we'll also have Q&A for any questions you might have for Charlie or Gary. We will have a closing survey that will be emailed to you by Friday. Once you fill out the survey, you'll receive the recording of this webinar. Like I said, the webinar is being recorded, which will be emailed to you after you take the survey. To optimize your experience during this webinar, feel free to ask questions by clicking on the message icon and typing in the box at the bottom left. If Charlie sees that your question is one he can answer without going too off topic, He'll answer it as he's presenting. Otherwise, we'll, he'll answer any questions at the end during Q&A. If you don't want to see the chat section, go ahead and click the X at the top of the message box, and you can view the screen and presentation in full screen by clicking the icon at the bottom right. I'll now hand it over to Charlie Hill, and he'll give his presentation on server virtualization. Charlie? Good morning. Uh, how's my audio level? Everybody hear me clearly? Yeah, we can hear you. And you should see uh, my presentation pop up on the screen any second now. How's it look? Yep, we could see it. Okay, good. <clears throat> All right, this morning I'm going to go over some key features in the new virtualization platform capabilities that uh, the new version of the operating system has. This is pushing and participating in a revolution towards the cloud that is, is everywhere. We hear it in our day-to-day -day work, and we also see it in the news. It's even becoming subjects of, of uh, popular TV shows. Well, we're going to take a look at some of those new abilities that we have. Wait just a second here. There we go. Our topics are going to include clustering and resiliency, how to make your um, infrastructure, particularly your virtual machines, as available as possible. This has been a goal for quite some time. We now have some new, very powerful tools to do this with uh, some incredible ease. You also don't have to completely refresh all of your inventory with new equipment. You can do a lot of this with surprisingly older equipment. We'll look at virtual machine mobility, which is how do you divorce the availability of a virtual machine from any problems that might encounter on the host machine that is running it. This is basically an extension of what we do with clustering. We'll also look at machine replication and protection. The things that cause a virtual machine to become unavailable uh, range from software on the virtual machine, issues with the hardware, network infrastructure, and we'll take a look at how each one of those things can be addressed with some of the new tools that are available. We'll look at private clouds with recent uh, news releases and recent press topics. The concept of clouds has fallen under some scrutiny, which is driving a few of my customers to uh, revert back to private clouds. And we'll take a look at how a private cloud can work and what, can, what that can do for you. We'll also look at the extension of that, which is virtualization in that hybrid cloud. In other words, not just using your private cloud, but using clouds that are available elsewhere, either through Microsoft or third-party providers. We'll look at VMware management, integration, and migration. Many of my customers are well entrenched in a VMware infrastructure, but given some of the benefits that are showing up on the Microsoft side, they are moving over. And that migration can be troublesome, can be difficult if you don't have the right tools. It's gotten a lot easier with the new set of tools. <clears throat> what I'm going to show you are all course excerpts. These are excerpts from uh, the new courses that are covering this very topic that Gary will talk about at the end of my presentation. It is a little bit clipped because I've had to uh, whittle it down for this presentation, but I'd like you to know that much of what you're seeing is directly from the courses, but in the courses we, we do take it to a greater depth of detail, and you also get hands-on opportunity to work with them. All right, the first topic is virtual machine clustering and resiliency, how to get your virtual machines available no matter what. Uh, this is part of failover clustering. This compares with VMware's HA or high availability platform. Clustering, failover clustering is now built right into the server operating system. And clustering, which is required 
some hardware infrastructure investments in the past that have taken it out of the um, price points for a lot of small businesses. It's changed now. You can do this with a lot of um, pretty inexpensive hardware that you may already have. Currently, nodes work by connecting, and now we have up to 64 nodes that you can have. So this, is, this can handle a very large cluster configuration. 64 physical nodes with 8,000 virtual machines on it. That's, that's pretty large. You can cluster physical servers, which we've been doing for a while, but you can also cluster the guest machines, the virtual machines running on those servers. And you can uh, cluster your scale out file servers, which make for fault tolerant file servers. This is a feature that in order to get, we often had to invest heavily into our SAN. The SAN is still very much a real part of this picture, but uh, you can do a lot of this without quite so much of an investment in your SAN infrastructure. In the past, building a cluster has been a bit troublesome. And what I mean by that is there were so many different pieces that had to work together and had to be configured correctly that the odds of getting from the beginning to the end without some sort of a problem were, were pretty low and it required expertise to get you to the finish line. Now there are validation tests built right into it, wizards that will preemptively test the equipment and the configuration before you do the rollout and tell you where the problems are so, uh, so you can address them prior to having them stop your, motive, your momentum. There is support now for redundant networks and teamed NICs, both for IPv6 and v4, and you can team the NICs on the host and on the guests. There's shared storage. Now, shared storage in the past has involved either iSCSI or a storage area network. Now, nearly any connectivity method you have available, server message block, uh, IP-based, iSCSI, serial attached SCSI, all of these are now available as storage for the clusters. And the clustered shared volumes is a, a component that allows all of the nodes across the different hosts to access the same storage and have write and read capability to it. This is actually necessary in order to have a, a effective failover. And here's the way failover clustering works. The different nodes will communicate with each other through what's called a heartbeat packet. They're all accessing the same, the same shared storage. And this is where the state information about the virtual machines that are running is actually stored. The execution happens on the hardware, but the information they're working with is on the shared storage. The uh, run on the host, but their storage is shared. Now the storage, as you probably are familiar with as a VHD, is now referred to as a VHDX. The only difference really is the config files are now XML, makes them easier to read and edit. So the nodes on the cluster are aware of each other because of this heartbeat packet that is zipping back and forth. And you should have a dedicated network for each of these different pieces, like for the heartbeat traffic. If the nodes miss an X amount of heartbeat packets, and we get to configure what this number is, then what will happen is the VMs will start up on the other machines. So after a certain number of heartbeat packets are missed, it literally, <clears throat> literally fires up that virtual machine on another node. And that's, that's failover. Failover in the past has involved some configuration challenges when it regards the quorum. For those of you who haven't worked with clustering before, quorum, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, quorum is a fancy word for majority. And it's how the cluster knows whether or not it should fire up. If you had, say, for example, four nodes to a cluster, and two of the nodes got separated from the other two nodes, then neither of those two sets is a majority. This means that your cluster is not functional and should not run, because if it does, you're gonna end up with problems. Well, cluster quorum is now dynamic, which helps us solve some of the weird problems you run into in the event of a failover. Say, for example, you lose a node. Here, you lose this one node in the quorum. Back up here, if you look right now, there are five votes. There's the four nodes and the shared storage. That's a total of five votes. In order to have a quorum, you have to have a majority. Well, what's going to happen when we lose one of these nodes is its vote is no longer part of the quorum, which takes us to an even number of votes. An even number of votes can result in a tie, which can result in the, the cluster going offline. So with dynamic clustering, it detects that you have a change in the topology and reduces the number of available votes back down to an odd number. 
So when we lost this node, the storage also lost its vote. We're back to three votes. Another nice change that has happened is to fire up the um, cluster and the cluster components, you used to have to be able to communicate with the domain controller. Now that requirement is no longer there, which is good because sometimes the node that was having the problem was the node that was hosting your domain controller. So now you can get around that. <clears throat> Failing over the virtual machines, this idea has been around for a little while. The idea that a virtual machine running on one machine, if it's mission critical, we ought to be able to fire it up on another machine. But something that's new to our clustering scenario is fault tolerant network configuration. We can now configure, can configure multiple virtual networks between the virtual machines. This, in order to work effectively, requires that your physical network also have several network connections. It's recommended that you have a, a different network connection for host management, for connecting to your servers and checking out how things are going. Yet another connection is used for the virtual machine access. Then one connection for live migration, which we'll talk about shortly. Live migration is the ability to move a virtual machine without bringing it offline. That is a data intensive transaction, so we want to have a dedicated pipe for it. And then cluster communications. This includes things such as uh, the heartbeat and server-to-server uh, -server communication. And then, if your storage is external, which it usually is for us, you'll want another network for connecting to that storage, the storage area network. This can result in a lot of network infrastructure that needs to be in place prior to rolling out your virtual machine and your virtual networks. But uh, it's, it's energy well worth spending because what you get in exchange for it is a much more resilient topology. Building a cluster, as I mentioned before, was it could, it could really be a challenge. There were so many different things from DNS and Active Directory, network configuration, your DHCP. There were so many things that you had to get lined up correctly to get your cluster to work. That, as I mentioned before, the odds of doing it successfully the first time were, were pretty low. You usually run into something that needs to be addressed. Well, now there's the cluster deployment wizard, which has all of the components necessary to build the cluster in a much easier to read, follow along, and resume wizard. This includes the ability to create a cluster, the ability to add hosts to the cluster from any available resources, and the, what my favorite feature, which is the validation. This is where the virtual machine manager will check your cluster configuration to make sure that all of the things you need for the cluster to work as you're configuring it are already there. I can't stress this one enough. This, this saves you a lot of trouble by telling you where the trouble is before you hit it at full speed. It also has access for storage and networks straight into the console for the cluster wizard. So you can answer all of these questions through the wizard. This doesn't mean that you can just sit down with a wizard and begin it without having considered this stuff before. You need to know what your answers are going to be before you begin this, but now you can provide all of the answers into one interface. Makes it quite a bit easier. Failover, priority, affinity, and anti-affinity. Up to now, our principal concern with failover has been make sure that this virtual machine is running, even if there's a problem with the host. And this has been a, a great leap forward for availability for us, but it doesn't come without its own problems. With affinity, some of the things that you can have happen, let me show you, is that when you have a server fail, a node on a cluster fail, it has to move those virtual machines to other nodes. Well, there are some virtual machines that just don't play well together. They could, you could have two virtual machines, each of which have a very high demand on CPU utilization. Well, if you're running both of those on the same host, it's going to impact the overall performance of those two VMs and anything else running on that host. So if you have virtual machines that should not work together, you can configure anti-affinity, and it will actually move the virtual machine away from another virtual machine it is configured to avoid co-locating with. This is uh, not something that all my customers need, but I've got a couple of clients that have a couple of virtual machines that you, 
They just they can run them on the same host, but when they do, the performance is degraded quite a bit. So now we configured them so that even during failover and live migration, those virtual machines are never on the same host. That's anti-affinity. <clears throat> virtual machine monitoring. An unfortunate reality of our line of work is that we normally find out about a problem through our telephones. A user calls us and expresses to us some sort of difficulty they're having, and then when we take a closer look, we find out what piece is broken. This makes for a very reactionary approach to network administration and network maintenance. If you can know about a problem prior to the problem resulting in an outage, then you can be more proactive. Instead of answering the phone with help desk, how can I help you? You can answer the phone with help desk, the server is back up, what can I do for you? This involves being aware of the problems. This is monitoring. Virtual machine monitoring takes a couple of different forms. There's passive monitoring, which is just writing down events and documenting them as they occur. <clears throat> and then there's the active monitoring built into the cluster monitoring system. This allows you to pick key components, such as a resource, an application, or a service that is running on a virtual machine and tag it as critical. What this means is that if that one service, program, or resource becomes unavailable, the cluster tools will automatically kick in to try and address that problem and make that available. Usually involves spinning the resource up on another node of your cluster. We get to configure the threshold. The default is after three failures. Uh, so what happens first is if the, if the service stops, the service is automatically restarted. And you, you need to babysit this a little bit because there's more than one tool that will do this. In some installations of the server, the server operating system itself is watching this. If you're having the server monitor a service, then you need to be aware of the impact of having the cluster manager watch the service too because what will happen is if the server itself is watching a service and it detects that that service has failed, it often restarts the service. Well, right about that time, the cluster manager figures, hey, that service has gone offline, and it tries to restart it too. And you can end up with the operating system and the cluster manager both restarting the service, resulting in the service never coming on board. So you want to be careful with virtual machine monitoring. But once it's in place, it takes care of the first two things we normally do when a service becomes unavailable. Restart the service, restart the server if necessary. Dynamic optimization. How do we get the most out of all this hardware that we're purchasing? How do we get the most out of the money that we have? It's one thing to build a server and to populate it with virtual machines, but to optimize how you are using your resources is another question. There's a couple of different goals in mind here. Resource optimization and resource utilization. Resource optimization means that I want to use as much of my resource as I can. This is often the goal if you want to save money on power. For example, if I've got several virtual machines and they're each running just one or, or several hosts and they're each running one or two virtual machines, I can probably handle that workload on one host, power down the others. And that's what resource utilization does for us. You get to set thresholds that are related to time of day. So if you see one host working too hard, it's got too many virtual machines running, with resource utilization, it can dynamically allocate those virtual machines to another node. If the performance becomes degraded by having too many on one node, you can configure optimization thresholds to move that workload back around. That's resource utilization. The goal being, try to get the most out of the servers that are running. Dynamic optimization, which is how we achieve this, these goals here, with dynamic optimization, we get to configure what thresholds matter to us. These are done in a couple of environments and for a couple of reasons. Load balancing is the process of distributing the workload across multiple nodes so that the work gets done faster and each of the resources is, is being taken advantage of. When you configure your optimization, you get to configure what's called the aggressiveness, which means how willing are you to move your virtual machines around in exchange for a performance benefit? 
highly aggressive means that you'll balance your workload, even if it just means you're going to get a little bit of a gain. Many of you will find that high aggressiveness um, results in a lot more migrations than may be necessary. If you go to low aggressiveness, it means you'll only move a workload if you're going to get a significant gain in performance out of it. And you get to setting, get the, set, the settings between them, including the resources that matter to you the most, based off the four big ones, CPU, RAM, disk, and network. This is heterogeneous, meaning you can do this, of course, on all of your Microsoft Hyper-V servers, but it'll also run vSphere and Zen server clusters as well and optimize the virtual machine workloads on those. Dynamic optimization for resource utilization. This is how we control our costs. So let's say that you start seeing the workload drop, typically towards non-production hours. Well, when it gets down below a certain point, it begs the question, why is that node even running? So with resource utilization, you can spin those virtual machines up on another node and actually power down that one host. This reduces power costs, reduces heat generation, which in turn reduces our cooling costs. Once the optimization threshold is reached back up, you can fire up the virtual machine and move the workloads back to where they belong. And all of this is dynamic and handled by the system. You set up the thresholds, you set up the criteria, it's a good idea to watch it happen, but the system takes care of the administration after that. Power optimization. As I mentioned before, sometimes we're trying to control our power costs by consolidating and relocating workloads. You can configure schedules to accommodate your peak productivity hours, your peak demand hours, and for some of us, our uh, power cost optimization. If you know you're getting lower cost power in the evenings and you can do workloads in the evening, you can accommodate this. Centralized virtualization patching. Uh, I myself have spent, I don't even want to think about how many hours, patching physical hosts and virtual machines. It's a tedious job. It requires a lot of testing. And as soon as you start introducing non-standard configurations, it compounds the workload. But with centralized virtual organization uh, patching, this is now a cluster-aware integration with Windows Software Update Services. WSUS, Microsoft's patch management utility, is now capable of working with clusters. The problem with clusters is the, the pattern in which you update the machines can have an impact on the other nodes in the cluster. There's also the virtual machines running on those clusters, and in some cases, those virtual machines themselves are clustered. This can significantly complicate the procedure for applying patches, both to the hosts and to the virtual machines. This is simplified now with a new version, which has, amongst other things, the ability for you to configure cluster-aware compliance. Once you've tested your applications and you know which ones can receive what category of updates, you can now automate the process across your farm through the central virtualization patch management tool. This includes update remediation, which means what happens if you cannot apply a patch to a server or to a virtual machine? Which ones got the patch and which ones did not get the patch? The ones who didn't get the patch, why didn't they get the patch? All of this can be included inside your scan for compliance. This will tell you which machines are not patched, which is an incredibly important piece of information. Comparing this against the VMware, I'm not going to read this whole list to you, but if you run down the list, you'll see that we now offer on Hyper-V very comparable and in some cases superior specs when compared even against the current version of vSphere. The one thing I will say um, comparing vSphere to Microsoft is the licensing costs are a lot easier to manage and understand on the Microsoft side. On the VMware side, the more features that you enable, drives the cost up, in some cases significantly. I imagine many of you are familiar with this. Guest clustering. So you've clustered the virtual machine, What uh, clustered the host, what about the virtual machines that are running on it? This is now a capability that we have. You could do it in the past, but it was it was very, very tricky. But now you can cluster on top of a cluster. 
meaning the node that is hosting one of the virtual machines that is a cluster, if it fails, you can fire that node of the virtual machine cluster up on another Hyper-V host, and the guest cluster remains intact. This works for uh, Hyper-V clusters. Your storage requirements are iSCSI, a virtual file channel or, or fiber channel or server message block, which means you don't have to have just fiber. You can now do this over conventional server message block connections. You can live migrate the guest cluster nodes. This is, a, this is nice, being able to proactively move a node of a cluster from one physical host to another physical host for maintenance purposes without bringing either of the clusters offline. It even supports the dynamic memory of the guest cluster nodes. In the past, you had to have fixed memory specifications for some of these in order to effectively migrate. But now it can deal with any differences in your memory configuration between the nodes. Restart priority, possible and preferred ownership and affinity class names. These are all components that allow us to have oversight over the movement of the nodes in the cluster. We can specify which hosts we would rather see starting. We can specify which nodes should hose, should house, I'm sorry, which nodes should host which guest VMs, similar to the anti-affinity explanation I gave you before, so that we can control how the workloads end up on the nodes of the cluster. You can do guest cluster now with shared VHDs. Now, clusters have always required, failover clusters, that is, have always required some form of shared storage. Up to now, this has typically been shared storage on some sort of clustered shared volume, uh, iSCSI or storage area network. But now, you can actually cluster just off of a regular file share. So any server that has server message block 3.0, you can create a share put a VHD, or VHDX as we call them now, into that share and have multiple guest nodes, so multiple virtual machines in a cluster, access that one VHDX as if it were shared storage on the network. The guest clusters will see it as attached storage just like they would if it was physically separate out there on your storage array. This gives us a lot of flexibility in how we set up our guest clusters including the ability to deal, in some cases, with some hardware problems on your storage arrays. If you have a guest cluster that is currently directly accessing storage on the storage array and you need to do maintenance, all you need to do is make that storage available as a VHD off a conventional share, and your clusters will operate. They might not have the same performance vectors that they had when they were accessing the data directly off a fiber channel, but you get operation. And if you have a fast enough server, you can get pretty close to those metrics. Unrestricted number of virtual machines can connect it to the same VHDX. Now, once you get to a certain number, it, it begs plausibility, but there's not a restriction built into the configuration. It can handle as many as you think you may end up sending to it. It utilizes SCSI persistent reservations to keep the guest node and the multiple guest nodes coordinated on their access to the shared file, to the shared storage. The VHD can be on clustered shared volume, block storage, or file-based. It really doesn't matter. As long as you have connectivity to the VHDX, you can have the guest nodes share it. Or it's both dynamic and fixed VHDs. The one area where I think many of you will find this useful is in the evaluation of clustering rollouts. If you're thinking about deploying a particular cluster configuration and you want to see if it will give you the availability and the performance that you need, you can do a dry run with just a shared folder somewhere with a VHD in it and test your configuration that way without having to allocate your clustered shared storage or your storage array to it. And here's a quick comparison side by side again between VMware all of this will be available in the presentation deck, I believe, that is going to be made available to you at the end of this presentation. As you can see, significantly larger number of nodes on our storage configuration options, Hyper-V compared to VMware. 
So once you have your cluster configured and you have your multiple physical nodes for both the physical cluster and in some cases for the guest cluster, once you have that in place, you have the infrastructure to accommodate some pretty interesting scenarios. Virtual machine mobility is the moving of the workload of a virtual machine from one node of a cluster to another node of the cluster. And we'll take a look at the options that we have and what that does for us. There we go. This is analogous to vMotion for those of you who already have a VMware infrastructure and are utilizing this feature there. It's very, very comparable. So with live migration, we'll take a look at live migration first. Live migration is moving a virtual machine preemptively so you know that you need to do this. Let's say your physical host is giving you error messages indicating you need to replace the power supply. So you want to take the machine offline so that you can open it up and replace the power supply, but there are virtual machines running on it. Well, with live migration, what happens is the host establishes an IP connection with another host, another Hyper-V host, and it starts copying the virtual machine over there. The way it does this is it first copies the configuration data. This is things like how much RAM, uh, what's the network configuration, what's the current operational status, at this point, that, that's tiny. The configuration is not much data. Then it starts sending over memory pages. This is what's actually happening in the CPU and RAM of that virtual machine. And it brings the memory contents over until they're the same. But while this is happening, while that uh, migration is happening, stuff is still occurring on the virtual machine. So there'll be changes to the memory. As the live migration process continues, it copies these changes, the modified memory pages. It keeps copying them over until the two virtual machines are exactly the same, at which point the original virtual machine is taken offline and all traffic is directed to the new instance of the virtual machine. The nice thing about this is that there's no interruption to user operation. If they're having any interaction with that virtual machine, they won't know that we're doing this. If you had special diagnostic software, you might be able to measure a slight drop in response time, but it's not something that's going to be user perceived. That's the whole idea behind live migration, is to take full advantage of the available network. We can now move multiple virtual machines at one time. How many virtual machines can you live migrate? Well, there's not really a numerical limit anymore, but you're going to run into practical limits. This copying of the memory pages and the configuration, this is potentially network intensive. So your network's ability to move this stuff over would be one of the few things that, that limits how many you can do at one time. If you've got a 10 gig network, you can use server message block direct, which is a much faster way of moving this content from one location to another. So your live migrations can happen quite a bit faster. We don't have to have just the fiber channel storage or server or storage area network. Now it can be server message block storage, fiber channel, or iSCSI. The shared storage, we got some options now for that. You don't have to have any clustering if the virtual machine is on a 3.0 file share. So we're actually live migrating without a cluster here. More about that in, in just a in just a moment. Live migration with compression is going to make this happen a lot faster. It starts out the same way, only now the traffic that gets sent across is going to happen a lot faster because of the compression algorithm. It squeezes the data down and then sends it over. This does require that your physical host have the extra processing power necessary to perform this compression. You're going to pay for it one way or the other. You're either going to pay for it in processor time to make the data smaller or you're going to pay for it with network time because the data is bigger. So whether or not live migration with compression is going to make it faster depends on which of those two resources were more plentiful. If the node that is housing the virtual machine is currently operating at or near capacity, then the compression process of squeezing the memory files down and making them smaller may end up taking longer than the amount of time you saved 
by moving the virtual machine. Especially if you flip it around, though, if your network is, uh, in, is very much congested, then sending a large block of data across is going to be more time consuming. You might get better throughput by squeezing it first before you send it across the network. So live migration with compression is not always going to make it faster. The nice thing about this configuration is that it figures out whether or not that's going to make it better before it does it. So it utilizes the CPU on your host, compresses memory before it sends it across the network, and this works even if you have below 10 gig. Not everybody has 10 gig on their servers, although most of us are in the process of switching to that right now. You can have twice the performance of live migration, potentially, potentially, it depends very much on available resources. That's live migration with compression. Now we're going to look at live migration over server message blocks. You can use the remote direct memory access feature to do this which is a very, very fast way of sending across configuration data and memory pages. It's very, very fast. Once all of that content is moved over, then the handle is pointed to the new target and the virtual machine is still active. The big difference for this is its ability to use almost all of your network resources to make this happen. So if you've got multiple NICs, teamed or otherwise, it can use those multiple pathways to get all of this content from the source to the destination in some pretty impressive time. It's a low latency. This is designed for low latency networks and higher bandwidth. In other words, if you've got a high latency network, this is not going to work for you. We've got something that will, but this is not it. Support speed up to 56 gigabits per second. The faster, the better. This is uh, R12 supports. ROCE, iWarp, and InfiniBand RDMA solutions, these are all different implementations of the remote direct memory access network implementation. Highest performance for live migrations is this way. If you've got the network, if you can pull up the RDMA, the remote direct memory access, and you need to move virtual machines while they are running, this really is the way to do it. You can take virtual machine migrations, which might take a minute or two, and it whittles it down to just a few seconds. It's really quite impressive. Storage live migration. Sometimes we're trying to move the virtual machine, its execution state, as is the case in this illustration here. It was, it was on one virtual machine, or rather, one physical host, and we wanted it moved to the other physical host. Now, in this illustration, watch what happens to the storage the stack of tires at the bottom of that illustration. I move the virtual machine. I move its memory, its configuration, and all of its pages, but the storage didn't move. This is live migration is a relocation of the execution of the virtual machine. All right, it's got a message pop up. I thought I should respond to it. And by the way, Brittany, if you're out there, it looks like there's a couple people waiting to get into the line. There we go. Thanks. Okay. So live migration is moving the execution state from one physical host to another physical host. And we need to do this a lot. But another thing that we need to do from time to time is to move the storage where the actual files reside. So storage live migration is the ability to move the location of the files without having to take the running virtual machine offline. And the way it works is all of the writes that are happening to the VHD get sent to the target location. This is a background process that continues until the two VHDs are exactly the same. Once the two are the same, then a foreground process duplicates every write going to one of the nodes and makes sure that all new changes appear on both storage arrays or whatever storage you happen to have it on. Once they are the same, then it will stop writing to the original and just continue writing to the target. So this is the relocating of the storage without having to take the virtual machines offline. This gives us the ability to now deal with whatever maintenance that storage array required without having to take the virtual machines offline to do it. This is all part of achieving our high availability goals, trying to have the machines up and running as long as we possibly can, as much as we possibly can. 
You can move the hard disks attached to a running virtual machine. This, and since we don't really care where the storage is, more about this coming up, but we have a lot of flexibility on where, where the storage is. This gives us the ability to integrate our in-house nodes with our hosted cloud nodes. So you can move the storage in and out of the cloud. You can move the virtual machines in and out of your provided cloud. And the cloud I'm talking about there is a third-party cloud, either um, Azure from Microsoft or maybe a third-party company that's hosting a service for you. You can move the storage with no downtime to the virtual machine that is running, giving you the ability to update your storage without having to take it offline. All of this is done through PowerShell. There's lots of commandlets available. For those of you who find PowerShell to be a bit daunting, there are third-party GUIs, and Microsoft is also working for, on graphical user interfaces for many of these features. So that's shared storage migration. You had an infrastructure in place. You had multiple storage arrays. We also had clustered virtual machine migration. That's the one I showed you here, live migration over server message blocks. <clears throat> but what if you have a situation where you don't have anything in common? In other words, you've got a Hyper-V host that's running a virtual machine, and you want it to get moved somewhere else. Maybe you need, know you need to take this host offline because it's having problems. Maybe the lease is up. It's time to decommission it. But you don't have a cluster configured, and you don't have shared storage. You don't need any of that to migrate a virtual machine, to relocate a virtual machine. The way it works is the live migration, the shared nothing live migration begins when the two machines establish this connection. This connection can happen across a high latency, low bandwidth connection. Now, the better the connection, the better this is going to work, but this doesn't require super high speed connections. It works pretty much the same way as the others. Once the replication begins, any content on one VHD is copied over to the target device until they are the same. Once the two devices are the same, then a foreground process copies every new piece of information going to the source to the target so that they are the same. Then once the storage is available in the other location, it copies the memory contents and it keeps this up until all of the memory pages are the same on the destination and then the handles point just to the destination. So this is migrating between two Hyper-V servers that have nothing other than a network connection in common. They don't even have to be in the same domain, although you will need to know necessary accounts. Very, very flexible for virtual machine administration, a uh, virtual machine administration and placement. You got a lot of options. You can almost move either the storage or the virtual machine anywhere you want now. Some are going to work better, faster, more secure than others, but we've got a lot of options now. You can live migrate the virtual machine and the disks between hosts. Nothing shared but an Ethernet cable. There's nothing else that you need. No clustering, no shared storage requirements. Nearly any one of us can perform this kind of a live migration as long as you have two 2012 servers available. Reduce downtime for migrations across cluster boundaries. So and this is a problem that several of my cluster customers, customers, <laughs> several of my customers have run into, which is clusters that were built several years ago when some of this technology was just emerging. These clusters have been operational and they're fulfilling the needs that they were built to handle quite well. But as the new features become available, it becomes desirable to move some of that into new cluster configurations. But in the past, this was very difficult. It involved basically an export and an import rather than just a live migration. Now you can move between different clusters to migrate out of an older platform into a newer platform. It does require that you get a couple ducks in the row, though. Live migration upgrades. So you have to upgrade a physical host. It's routine. we got to do this at least once a year, at least. You ought to be patching your hosts actually the second Tuesday of every month after appropriate testing. Well, when you perform an upgrade on a host, you can't have virtual machines running on it. So what happens here when you do this is it starts with one host, moves the workload to other nodes, 
reboots and applies necessary patches to that, then starts moving the workload around so it can go by server by server through your cluster and upgrade each of the nodes without impacting the operational state of the virtual machines. So this gives us a no downtime post migration. In order to do this, uh, you have to have a couple things. It supports a shared nothing live migration, or if you've got the other live migrations in place, it can work a little bit faster. If you're using a server message block share, it only transfers the running state across it for faster completion because we don't need to move the storage. And this is all automated through PowerShell. There are a few graphical user tools that will trigger the PowerShell actions for you, and I'm seeing some development in third-party tools for this as well. This is a one-way migration. In other words, once it's done, if you don't like where the virtual machines ended up, you're going to need to go in and reallocate them or rely on some of your cluster affinity, non-affinity, and preferred owner settings to do it. So once again, uh, comparing between Hyper-V and VMware, you'll see that you can have unlimited live storage migrations. The more bandwidth you have, the better off it works. All right, virtual machine replication and protection. So you've got your cluster in place to keep it up and running. But one of the problems with a cluster is if you have um, a failure, a hardware failure, the cluster is the tool for the job because a cluster has redundant hardware components and redundant capabilities. So if the reason something's not working is because of uh, a hardware problem, then a cluster will protect you from that. But what if the problem isn't because of hardware? What if the problem is because of, say, corruption? Let's say the data in a virtual machine, let's say you get a virus. If you get a virus, then the cluster is not really going to protect you against this. Instead, what you'll have are several infections of the cluster, all with the same virus. This is where backup starts to become more important than clustering, the ability to go back in time. We have incremental backup capability of the virtual machines now. This allows for more backups to occur throughout a particular period of time. The more backups you have, theoretically, the more points in time you can return to. This gives you more options uh, to help try and find a recovery point that's prior to the infection or the corruption, but is still as recent as you can get, so you are losing as little data as possible. It is volume shadow service aware, both for the hosts and for the guest virtual machines, meaning you can do incremental backups of the virtual machine while it is running. It backs up the Hyper-V environment, and there's no backup agent required inside the virtual machine. If the virtual machines are running Microsoft operating systems, especially the more current ones, then you get some nice features where it will take advantage of the capabilities built into the operating system. But this works for non-Microsoft clients as well. Incremental backups only back up the changes that have occurred since the last backup. This results in less data going across the wire. There is a disadvantage to incremental backups, and that is that incremental backups require more separate pieces in the event that you actually have to do a restore. You can't just go grab the most recent backup because it's only going to have the changes since the one before it. So recovery can be a little bit more involved. You might need several incremental backups. But with this technique and this technology, it would be available to you. It reduces your backup sizes. Uh, this is not the only backup solution, and this is actually probably not the one that's the most recommended. There are other backup capabilities that allow us to do full point-in-time recovery options for both the hosts and the virtual machines, such as Data Protection Manager. Okay, uh, I have T. Stevens asking if there's a white paper for how to get from uh, 2012 CSV to 2012 R2. Yeah, there's quite a few documents available online. If, as a matter of fact, if you just did uh, a search for that, you would find the same ones that um, I would find. The, at this point, since it's relatively early in the product's life, 
There are a relatively small number of case studies and white papers out there, but there is documentation to help you get to where you're going from where you are. And by the way, that particular configuration you're talking about, 2012 with CSV to 2012 R2, is going to be one of the easier migrations. So that should be a lot easier for you to get done, Stevens. I hope that answered your question. Okay. So incremental backups save disk space. Personally, I disagree with that statement because your cumulative incremental backups are still going to be the size of whatever data changes have occurred. But each individual backup is going to be smaller. This gives us more flexibility. We can get things done in narrower windows of time. But as somebody who deals a lot with backups, over time, your total disk, disk, disk space savings is not going to be as much as you think. It lowers backup cost, but it does complicate recovery. Let me highlight this point again because they're not mentioning it as much here as I think it should. If you have, let's say, four incremental backups necessary for a recovery, then you have to be able to recover all four of those backups in order to get your data. This makes you four times as likely to have a problem. So incremental backups, which back up into smaller pieces, give us greater flexibility on when we can do it, but we pay for it at the other end when it comes to restore complexity and restore delicacy. And what I mean by that is if you've got four pieces, you're four times as likely now to have one of them give you a problem. Since we are not backing up to tape, directly like we used to, although some of you may still be pretty heavily invested in your tape infrastructure. Most of us are backing up now from server to another server, in other words, from a, a disk configuration to another hard drive. And then from the second hard drive, we back up to tape. Tape still is very much a, a very real part of our disaster recovery scenario because it's the most portable and the most physically durable, but it's also the slowest and some of the most error prone. So backing up to disk alleviates some of that dependency on the tape while still providing tape as an option. New to the landscape, cloud-based backup. It's a concept that's been percolating for quite a while. It's just now getting to the point where it's viable. We've rounded a corner. The big hurdle was internet connection speeds. And those are finally climbing up to the point where this is a viable backup solution. Windows Azure, Microsoft's cloud providing uh, wing of their business, also provides backup. So what happens is they'll send to one of your administrators an email with a, a special piece of software that you'll fire up. What this will do is it will create a relationship between your servers and the account that you have on Windows Azure. So you have to figure, you have to sign up for an account, figure out what degree of service you want, and arrange the necessary billing and payment for that. But once that's in place, then your backup component has a direct write capability to Windows Azure. So from right there from within Windows Server Backup, you don't even need to use a special backup tool for this. You can use the one that comes with the operating system. You can schedule your backups to backup locally to the cloud and to a third-party cloud if you have such a service provided for you. The fact that this integrates with the uh, volume shadow service of, uh, aware components inside the operating system also makes it open to third party. This is a very easy cloud backup solution to configure. Once you sign up for it, you can have it up and running in about 15 minutes, maybe 30 if you want to get yourself a cup of coffee. It's really easy to set this up. If you've got an Azure account and you already have cloud-based services, this is a great way to extend your disaster recovery and your fault tolerance. Once you have this stuff in place and you are backed up to the cloud, you're protected against a large array of possible outages. You can use either the Windows Backup Agent or PowerShell Commandlets. Uh, if you're backing up individual servers or something that integrates with Microsoft's backup, you'll probably use the uh, GUI. But if you have a sophisticated or a non-standard server configuration, or if your production workloads require that you do some pretty creative time scheduling, then you're probably going to go for the PowerShell command lens. And those of you who do backup, um, you know what I'm talking about, especially 
on clustered based services. It's not as simple as beginning a backup. You've got to be aware of current workloads, network traffic, performance vectors, uh, available storage, other backups that are happening. So being able to back it up to the cloud like this is a, a nice option. Reduces cost for backup storage and management. Uh, what they mean by this is you're still paying. You're paying somebody to maintain this for you, but it can be done through a cloud-based service for significantly less than it would cost you to get the same degree of reliability on your own. You would have to invest in an infrastructure that they already have invested in. So that's where you get the reduced cost. And there are straight hooks into third-party cloud services. So if you've got other third parties, see who might that be? Yeah, Amazon, for example, or some other provider, you can communicate and hook straight up into them. This is great for small business branch offices. If you're a very large organization with uh, thousands or tens of thousands of computers, you probably already have fault-tolerant, location-independent disaster recovery solutions for you. You've spent the money, you've designed the system, you've tested it. But for small businesses or a branch office, that's an expense that, that they just can't rationalize. So they basically live in terror of an outage. They just hope it won't happen to them or face the consequences when they do. So having a Windows Azure backup for a small office, I've got a couple of clients who, who opted for this now. So far, we haven't had a catastrophic failure, but email and file recovery has been blissfully simple. Hyper-V replica. So let's say that uh, you want a virtual machine to be available in more than one location, but not at the same time. This is part of a disaster recovery or a failover scenario, not um, clustering to expand to, to meet larger demand. So here's the way it works. You've got virtual machines running on one site with Hyper-V replica, which is designed to work on low bandwidth, high latency, so not really fast networks. What it does is it copies all of the necessary information, configuration, content, files, it copies all of that stuff to the secondary site. Any changes that occur at the primary site are then sent at intervals of your choosing to the secondary site. The idea is that if something bad happens to the primary site, you can fire up the secondary site and you will have lost a minimal amount of work. Hyper-V replica is a low cost, easy to implement solution for disaster recovery for small businesses all the way up to large businesses. It's very, very affordable because the, the requirements for it are minimal. It doesn't require any special network, any special storage. Require The interval that you can specify is 30 seconds, 5 minutes, or 15 minutes. Um, most of my clients are going for 5 minutes. It depends on a couple things. One is how many changes do your machines get within a window of time? How much of this replication traffic that's getting sent over, how much is that? If it's a little bit, then you can do nice small intervals. But if it's a lot, you might have to work around other traffic that's on your network. If you go with bigger intervals of 15 minutes, you end up with less frequent transfers to the other location, but there is a possibility in the event of an outage that you can lose roughly 15 minutes worth of work. This replication that occurs is encrypted. We secure it. It's agnostic of hardware on either site. In other words, your, your uh, physical machines don't even have to match. Your storage doesn't have to match. Your network doesn't have to match. There's no need for any other replication component in place. This is like a shared nothing migration, only this isn't live. It's the recreation of the virtual machines in an alternate location. Principally, this is a disaster recovery solution. It allows you to set up a secondary site, or what we call a warm site, for a fraction of the cost it used, you used to incur trying to do the same thing. Simple configuration and management really is. This is an easy one. And one of the nice things about this is in the event that everything's working just fine, you have your primary site, and you've got stuff happening that is getting replicated over to your secondary site. And that's the way things work normally. You're confident that if something bad happens, it's okay, we've got the information on the secondary site. So at this point where you've got both sites going and you're getting these replicated changes coming across, life is good.
but then something bad happens and you lose your primary site. At this point, life's not so good. You're still working, you're still operational, you fired up those virtual machines on your secondary site, but now you have no backup. Now you're, you're to the point where if anything else fails, you've got bad things to deal with. So one of the things that you can do with this is you can extend it to a secondary site and then a tertiary site if you want. So in the event of a failover, you can trigger further replication to yet a third site. This way, you're back up to fault tolerance again. I'm not sure how many of you have been in a situation where your normally fault tolerant system experiences a failure. You're still operational, but you're no longer fault tolerant. And at that point, there's a lot of anxiety involved. There's something else should continue to happen suddenly all that effort you put into your infrastructure isn't helping you. So the ability to, to on the fly add or configure a third site for this is really a nice feature. It's very easy to do too. Uh, this is what's referred to as chained replication. So any changes that occur at the initial site will get sent to the secondary and also from the secondary onto the tertiary site. Nice thing about this is the replications come in a chain, meaning your, your primary site doesn't have to have direct communications to all of the additional sites that you replicate out to. They all match the original contents. This isn't a latency. We're not trying to lag any of these. We want them to be the same. The replication to the third or beyond sites can be at a different interval. Let's say you decide for a 30 second interval between your primary and secondary, you can go back up to 15 minutes between your secondary and your third site. This is great for a variety of situations, especially if you are a provider and you're providing a service for somebody else. So you are backing up their service, but what happens if your infrastructure experiences a problem? You're no longer offering them redundancy. You no longer have fault tolerance. So this gives you the ability to com commit and fulfill your service level agreement of fault tolerance. Could be replica and extended replication. This really is an incredibly useful feature. This, along with shared nothing live migration, I think are two of the uh, probably the biggest features for disaster recovery and fault tolerance. Another thing that's really nice is a new tool that helps you deal with what happens when something happens. In the event that you have a cloud infrastructure internally and or you are uh, subscribed to a cloud service somewhere else, you've got all these degrees of fault tolerance in place. You end up with, in many cases, a pretty sophisticated configuration, which means in the event that something bad does happen, it's a pretty delicate scenario. There's a lot of ways for it. To, there's only a, one or two ways for it to go right, but there's a lot of ways for it to go wrong. To help you out with this now, there's the Windows Azure Hyper-V Recovery Manager. This is a tool that integrates with the Hyper-V cloud that you have internally and whatever you've got subscribed to through Azure. And the way it works is this tool will handle all of the replication between your data centers. It also handles failover for things such as your line of business or any of your test or development code that's going on. This thing makes sure that they're replicated <clears throat> during normal operations. And in the event of a failure, this coordinates the redirection of traffic to the alternate site. It basically is um, a glorified PowerShell script, to be honest. It's really a collection of all of the individual steps that have to occur configured in an automated scenario. Here's the idea behind this. And, and I don't know how many of you have been at work when there's been a catastrophic failure of a mission critical component. But it's a pretty stressful day. Right at that particular time, uh, adrenaline is running, anxiety is high, emotions are high. Those are ingredients that lead to bad decision making. This is not the kind of thing that you can effectively test. You can test your failover mechanism. You can wait to the middle of the night or some non-production hours, and you can give it a shot, and you can see if the failover works the way you think it's going to work. But that's not the same experience as when the alarms sound at 
10 o'clock in the morning on a production Tuesday. At that point, you've got all of the users who are on the network to deal with. Your phone's going to light up. People are going to get in your face and ask how long this is going to take. That's not the time to try and figure your way through the failover mechanisms. That's where the recovery manager comes in. It takes a lot of your decisions out of this process. You get to prioritize which resources and services are the most important, and you get to prioritize the conditions of a failover and the goals that you want to have. And then this thing coordinates all of the necessary replication and failover configuration. In other words, once you set this up, you can get out of its way in the event of a failure. This works both for planned and unplanned and testing a failover. Now, a planned failover or test failovers are two that we do a lot. They're not the same. They're different things. A planned failover is when you know you need to move workload because you have to do some maintenance to where the workload currently resides, whether that's storage or, or hosts. An unplanned failover is when something bad happened and now you have to deal with it. And then a test failover is when you test all of the failover mechanisms without completely performing the failover. So the last one, a test failover, tests all of the components, but it's not actually going to move the workload. The planned failover is preemptive and proactive. It's not a disaster. It's you doing work. But that middle one, the unplanned failover, that's the one that's going to be educational for you. The more of the first and last that you do, the more planned and the more testing that you do, the less surprising the unplanned failover is going to be. It integrates with scripts for customization of your recovery plans. Because uh, I've been doing this a long time. I've been working with computers since the mid-'80s. And I've seen a lot of disasters. And so far, I have not seen a single disaster that went the way we thought it was going to be. For over 25 years swinging at this, not once have I ever seen an actual unplanned failover that went exactly the way we thought it was going to go. But what's happening over the last couple of years is it's getting closer and closer with each new iteration. So the ability to do the plan and the testing failover gets us closer and closer to that. Incremental backups is something that we can do. You can get it on vSphere 5.5, and the inbox virtual machine replication is also available on both of them. That's the ability to uh, replicate for alternate failover sites. Here's another quick list. Again, I'm not going to read all of these to you. Private clouds. Private clouds and user roles. So a private cloud is a cloud that belongs to an entity, whether it's uh, yours and you own all of the hardware, or maybe you have a data center that is leasing you portions of their resources, in which case you can actually have multiple different clouds happening within a data center. This can create some challenges such as how do you administer these? Who's in charge of what portions of these clouds? In many cases, these clouds are services provided to yet another party. So you have administration challenges here. If it's your data center, you need to administer the servers and the hardware. But if you're providing it as a service to customers, they need to administer the resources in the cloud that you are allocating to them. We often separate our clouds based on functions, such as development versus production. And we also delegate capacity. Delegating capacity is assigning resource capabilities to particular clouds. And then there's also the delegation of administration to it. So you are in charge of the data center, but you're not in charge of the cloud that one of your customers is leasing out of that data center. So there's several layers to private clouds. Now, if it's all your equipment, it's your equipment, it's your clouds, it's your resources, even within your organization, there's going to be some division about who owns what and who needs to work on what. So even in private clouds, we have this stratification of permissions and administration that can sometimes be challenging. Now, building the cloud in the past, like building a cluster, 
was potentially very frustrating. There were a lot of things you had to have lined up correctly, uh, a lot of hardware, a lot of software, patches, revisions, user accounts, permissions, firewalls. There's a lot of things that you had to do. Well, now there's a cloud creation wizard, which will help you to identify all of the resources. It will identify your networks and load balancers that you have in place, identify the storage that is available to each one of those clouds and the capacity, both um, performance-wise and storage-wise, for each one of those clouds. It's now wizard-based. It's a lot easier to set this up. I don't want to make it sound like you can put somebody in front of the keyboard who doesn't understand this and they'll build a cloud. Because you still need to understand and be able to speak intelligently to the questions that it's going to ask you. The difference is you don't have to remember all of the questions. You don't have to remember all of the steps. This is going to walk you through it. So this is building the cloud. The next thing is once the cloud is configured, there's questions of administration. Depending on who you are in the organization, you're going to have varying degrees of control. For example, let's say that I'm, I'm a provider and I've carved out part of my cloud for one of my customers and they're running their network on it. Well, to support their network for their people, they probably have help desk staff. That help desk staff needs to be able to see elements of the cloud and see elements of the network that they're supporting, but we don't want them being able to make changes. So we call this a read-only administrator. This is help desk being able to look things up just so they can figure out why something might be malfunctioning. A similar but separate degree of permissions would be assigned to a self-service user. Now, a self-service user is somebody who's taken advantage of something on your cloud. Maybe it's a virtual machine, maybe it's an application. Only they have no administrative capabilities to the cloud at all. They can't do anything other than fire up one of these virtual machines or fire up one of these uh, services. You can give them more permissions. You can give them the ability to actually build new virtual machines, to fire up virtual machines, to share resources. But it's not the same as a full administrator because they will only have these permissions to the things that they have been designated as an owner over. So self-service, think about a web developer. Uh, web developers often need to test their code on a variety of different platforms. Make sure that this code is going to work well on an Android phone or an Apple laptop or a PC desktop, all with different browsers. So the self-service user can fire up a virtual machine that meets the testing requirements of that project. When they're done, they shut down that virtual machine and go about their job. Later on, when they come back and need to test on something else, they can fire up a virtual machine that matches that test criteria. I set up what they can do in the beginning, but then I lead them to their own resources and needs. Then we have a tenant administrator. So again, I've, I've carved part of my cloud out for a company. That company is going to put somebody in charge of the cloud resources that they use. That's the tenant administrator. This is somebody typically from that company that works in a liaison relationship with you. They can control clouds, they can build networks, they can assign cloud resources, they can uh, set up other roles such as read-only administrator and self-service user within that portion of the cloud. Then there's you, the person responsible for administering maybe not just this cloud's availability, but other clouds availability. You can do just about anything, although I want to stress that the power you have in your tenants' computers is getting more and more restricted with each passing quarter. As security is becoming a bigger and bigger deal, in many cases, the administrator of the hosted cloud actually has little, if any, access to the files that belong to the tenant. Just because I'm the administrator doesn't mean I need to be looking at everybody's personal records. Then, there's the virtual machine administrator. Now we're talking about hardware, almost no direct relationship with the software that's running on it. This is just making sure that your cluster and your cluster and cloud resources are up and running. So this role-based administration, uh, as you can see, this, this 
illustration right here that shows the nested boxes. This is just one synopsis. There's a lot of different ways that these permissions end up panning out in the real world. And up to now, one of the problems we've had is that if you gave somebody the permissions necessary to do something even remotely administrative level, you often ended up giving them way more permissions than they really needed. Well, now this role-based delegation is extremely granular. You can go all the way down to different clouds, production versus test and dev, and give different groups very specific permissions, all the way down to the virtual machine and the service level. It works seamlessly with Active Directory, so you don't have to create up another set of accounts for this. You can use accounts that are already there. Uh, global and cloud-specific permissions, so you can say these are the permissions they get everywhere, but these are the permissions they get in development. It's different from what they get in production. There we go. So that's setting up the permissions for your cloud. Now, how do we take advantage for this cloud? How do we take advantage of this thing that's in place? There's now the app controller, which allows us to create different kinds of experiences and different access methods. We can set up, this, this is a self-service tool that the users can use to interact and that we can use to administer. It allows us to specify service providers. This is, what I mean by this is, what is the access and the connectivity method for the clients to get into the cloud services that you're providing for them. We can also delegate from this. We can control the delegation granting individual users individual permissions or rights within it. And we can also deploy apps. Now we say apps here, but the app can actually be an app running on a virtual machine and then made available as a web resource. So this app controller is a much easier way Really what ends up happening here is there's often a division of responsibility. There is, as often the case with me, is I'll come in and I'll build the network, I'll build the clusters, and I'll build the initial foundation, but then somebody else comes in and starts putting apps, specific virtual machines on it. They build the line of business logic and capabilities, but then there's somebody else who's responsible for granting the users access to the resources that are appropriate for that user. This is a tool that they will use, the app controller. You can specify RDP, access into the VMs, or web-based access, which is kind of nice. You don't actually have to have an RDP client out there. All right, how are we doing on time? About 10, 10, 30, we're doing okay. All right, virtualization with the hybrid cloud. Uh, I'm not seeing a lot of questions pop up in the chat window. I'm not sure if that's because I have a very small chat window or if because there aren't any questions just yet. Does anybody have any questions so far as we're progressing through this? keeping one eye on that chat window, but I haven't seen them pop up yet. I'm going to take that to mean that there aren't a lot of questions just yet. Does anybody have any question right now? Waiting, waiting. Okay. Then. So next component, virtualization with a hybrid cloud. This is where almost all of my customers end up. A hybrid cloud is where some of the stuff is maintained by you, but some of it is maintained by a third-party service provider, or maybe some of it is, is maintained by Microsoft themselves, a third-party provider. A hybrid cloud gives us varying degrees of resiliency. By having it provided by somebody else, you are no longer dependent on your own resources and your own facilities and locations. But it does introduce some additional layers of complexity. Trying to get your resources integrated with the cloud, your failover mechanism integrated with the cloud, your security mechanism integrated with the cloud, this can produce some challenges. So a hybrid cloud is where you combine your private cloud with resources that you're getting from somebody else. With this kind of configuration, we get some, we get some interesting options. You get, for example, cross-premise connectivity. That's where the hosted cloud resources and the cloud resources that match it, that are inside your organization, they communicate as if they were in the same place. You are going to be 
throttled to a certain extent by your connection to the internet. The bigger, the better, the faster. The bigger, the faster, the better. It then creates an encrypted connection between the cloud and your location, and it uses that encrypted connection to keep the sites current, to keep all of the resources current in both locations. Uh, you can also set up a VPN standardized router to it, so you don't have to use the Microsoft servers in the cloud and locally. You can actually use third-party VPN hardware to do it as well, as long as it uses IKE v2 version of the Internet Key Exchange. It is an encrypted tunnel between the cloud and your location, so anybody eavesdropping on this traffic will have a hard time reproducing the virtual machines that you have. It's a pretty inexpensive solution. Now, you are paying for the hosted services, but when I say inexpensive, I, what I'm comparing is what it would cost you in investments to achieve the same degree of resiliency. And it's not even close. It's so much less expensive to hire a hosting provider for cloud services than it is to build out your own multi-location cloud. Some of the issues that we have. There are, oh, I the wrong button there, there we go. Multi-tenancy. Multi-tenancy is where you have multiple organizations that are using your resources. Now, this is if you are a provider. Some of you may be considering becoming providers. Some of you will consider utilizing a provider. So you're either setting this up for somebody else, or you might be one of the red, green, or blue enterprises here. But what happens is you have the remote sites, that, and then you have your service providers. Via the internet, you are going to establish connections through the clustered multi-tenant gateway, which is uh, active standby. So this is a cluster, so you're, you're not subject to single point of failure right here. Each of the organizations creates a secure tunnel to the gateway. Then through that gateway, they are connected to their own resources on the service provider. It uses the border gateway protocol so that if changes occur in any of your tenants' uh, network geography, those changes can be communicated through the border gateway router protocol to the multi-tenant gateway. Basically what this means is the cloud that is out there that is part of your network becomes an extension of your network quite seamlessly, including the ability to change router configurations, and as long as you're using the border gateway protocol, those router changes get automatically shared with the cluster gateway for the cloud and updated correspondingly. Each of these variables is a potential for something to go wrong. If I go in and change one of my router configurations and I'm already set up to have services hosted on the cloud that I use, then I'm probably going to have a problem with it and I'm going to have to manually deal with the changes in the router configuration. But with BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, that's no longer the case. So the complexity is still here. This is still a very sophisticated configuration with a lot of moving pieces. Only the administration of it has been dramatically simplified. It's much easier to get this stuff running and to keep it running than it was in the past. There's a gateway manager. If you are the hosting provider, then that'll be you. If you're the client, then this is the person you're going to call whenever you have an issue with connecting to your cloud-based network. Windows Azure, Microsoft's commercial cloud service. This is Microsoft operating and offering infrastructure as a service. Infra there's a lot of as a service terms floating around the industry right now. Software as a service, uh, platform as a service. Infrastructure as a service refers to your infrastructure, your connection of routers, your domain controllers, your DNS servers, all of that stuff that just keeps the network running. With infrastructure services, you can spin up virtual machines, both Windows and Linux, in just minutes. The uh, standard service level agreement with this is a 99% uptime. Now, 99% uptime it does not technically fall into the category of high availability. Most people consider uh, four nines to be the beginning of high availability. That's 99.99%. At that point, you're down to about uh, a few hours a year. At 99%, that means you can still reasonably expect to have 
up to 80 hours of downtime over the course of the year. Hopefully those will be scheduled maintenance intervals. Setting up the infrastructure services is, is very easy now with the app controller and the new web interfaces for it. It's very easy to set these things up now. There's a lot of templates that are out there. The templates used to be a good place to start and then you would customize them. Last time I looked at the templates, there's a bunch of them and they cover an amazingly detailed degree of different configurations. So the odds of having to build something from scratch are pretty low. You are probably going to have to edit some of these templates a little bit, but not like building it from scratch. You can specify different machines to deploy these templates that you build. And this integrates with a self-service account. So if you've got a lot of web developers who still need to test stuff on IE6 on XP, you can create virtual machines for that and then have them fire them up as needed through the self-service portal. Connectivity between Azure consists of all of your local resources, all of their resources, and then a virtual private network tunnel between them. This allows the replication to occur across hopefully a high speed and now high security network connection. It uses the Windows Server R12, Doug 2012R2 inbox gateway to connect the, your private cloud to the services on the Azure cloud. Again, all of this stuff is now wizard-driven, wizard-configured, much easier to set up, much easier to get up and off the ground. Right. Your networkers, the nice thing about the uh, when you've got your stuff integrated into Azure Cloud is your users can be just about anywhere. And when they connect, they can connect either to the network that's cloud-based or your network. It doesn't really matter what they experience is going to be the same in either case. All right, VMware. They've had a significant head start over Microsoft in the industry, and they currently have the dominant market share. But Microsoft is very aggressively going after this by offering uh, products and features at a price point that is, is becoming very desirable. Well, we're going to take a look at what happens if you decide to go from VMware to Hyper-V or perhaps cohabitate, having some VMware and some Hyper-V running side by side. There's the, the new tool, the Virtual Machine Manager. It's actually not that new a tool, but it's been um, tweaked and tuned so that now it communicates directly with vSphere, which is VMware's enterprise management console for your clusters and your cloud. What this means is you can set up Virtual Machine Manager and control your uh, ESX hosts and your vSphere hosts that are out there. It controls vCenter all the way up to 5.1, 4.1 to 5.1, and ESX and ESXi 4.1 up to 5.1. This tool is for doing most of the work that we do most of the time. Not all of the features and capabilities are in this tool, but things like firing up virtual machines, managing them, storing them, deploying them, all the routine kind of stuff that we do every day is built right into this tool. If you need to do something beyond that, well, there are other tools for it. This is just the quick and easy one. So if you're going to do anything more sophisticated, you might still end up using vCenter to get to handling some of the infrastructure components on your VMware side. It supports existing, creating new vSphere and new service templates. So the earlier version of this was great for configuring what was already there, but it, it was troublesome if you wanted to build new stuff. Now you can build new stuff. Now you can set up new VMs and new templates from this tool. It supports vMotion, storage motion, persistent uh, virtual SCSI, thin provisioning, just about all of the core features that make vSphere and Hyper-V both really effective can be integrated and administered through this one tool. The idea here is Microsoft's going to make it very, very easy for you to go from what you had to what they would like you to have. There's an app controller for vSphere, app controller, but there's the app controller works with vSphere is what I mean to say here. So configuring who can have access to what, what virtual machines and services are available is handled through the app controller. It works not just for a Hyper-V and vSphere, but also Zen server. So if you have any Zen server hypervisor hosts out there, you can integrate and control them through the same console. 
Users and groups can be delegated. Both the vSphere and individual capacity limits can be specified. In other words, I can use the vSphere administrative accounts and delegate to them certain degrees of control and also specify individuals having custom levels of control. Users can deploy virtual machines based on the VMware's vSphere templates on vSphere hosts. And through the same console, they can also administer Hyper-V hosts and Hyper-V virtual machines. But it's nice to know that through this console, they can access the vSphere. What they're trying to do here is to minimize the number of different tools that you have to use. Because the more different tools you have to use, the more complexity it begins to accumulate. If I can do just a handful of tools and administer two different platforms, vSphere and Hyper-V, it makes my job easier. And that's what Microsoft wants. They want it to be very easy for you to go from the competitor to them. We also have Veeam capability to, get, to give you quite a bit of control. Come on here. There we go. Yeah. Animation pause there. This lets you take a look at the actual workloads placed on your hardware by each of the different virtual machines. It is a very extensive degree of metrics that you can gather about how hard your virtual machines are working. This is very valuable information when it comes time to assess your design and the viability of your current configuration. You need to know how hard is it working? Can my system handle the amount of work that might be coming at it? This is an agentless collection. What that means is you don't have to install anything onto the virtual machines. It's actually going to get all of this information straight from the hypervisors. It's full system center functionality, which means it integrates with system center operations, app manager, VMM, all of the, the big system center tools. Powerful reports, there's a lot of them. As a matter of fact, there's kind of a community of people sharing additional reports and uh, changing them. You can customize these reports. The list of reports is really quite extensive. It also gives you a nice topology views, and this is pretty cool. I like this. The topology of view allows you to look at different topologies. So you can look at your physical topology, your networking topology, your storage topology, and your compute topology. Now, these often look similar, but they can also look very, very different. And in the past, getting these topologies, getting these diagrams involved having to, in some cases, manually produce them or using a couple of different tools. Now it's all through one tool. This becomes great for troubleshooting. You can come straight in here and look at those red X's you see on the screen and take a little bit of a couple of clicks and figure out what's going on with it. So the operations manager has really improved oversight and administration of an integrated vSphere and Hyper-V configuration. We also get Orchestrator. Orchestrator takes some of the really common routine tasks that you do. And, and there's going to be, of the, I think, 35 or so tasks you see on the screen right here, there's some you're going to do a lot. There's some you might never do. And then there are uh, collections of them that you will do routinely. You can actually take these tasks and build out-of-the-box activities for things you have to do for automating your vSphere and your Hyper-V deployment, such as get information from a VM, take the snapshot, reconfigure the VM, send an email. You can daisy chain all of those together as a task and then trigger that task whenever you need it. You can connect to Orchestrator, to vCenter, or to ESXi directly with this tool. This allows you to uh, automate these tasks. Now, automation is great because I like automation because I don't have to remember all of the details. As a consultant, I'm often going from location to location, and it may have been a month since the last time I saw this server's details. So having to remember all of the individual steps is setting me up for a mistake. But having a task that contains already configured steps for me means I'm less likely to make a mistake like that. If there's a task that the administration pack doesn't have, you can build them. You can build them through uh, the PowerShell command line interface or through scripts or whatever programmatic capabilities are available to you. So you can add to these tasks. If you delegate work to people as they come onto your team, then this is a great way to do that. Because as new people come on board, 
they often have basic understanding, that's why you hired them, but they don't have specific understanding of the system because they just started. You can create tasks for them that takes care of the routine jobs that they have to do, and by automating it like this, you don't have to worry about the new person forgetting a key step. VMware to Hyper-V migration. There's the Microsoft Assessment and Planning Toolkit. This is a program that, believe it or not, Microsoft will give you for free that will help you to migrate from VMware to Hyper-V. Isn't that thoughtful of them? This really is a very effective tool. What it'll do is it will assess your current network. And again, this is an agentless tool, so you don't have to install anything on each of the VMs. But it runs an assessment of your current configuration, and it'll tell you which machines are ready to migrate with little or no change, which ones are going to require some changes, and which ones are flat out non-migratable. And the nice thing about this is it didn't do anything to your configuration. This is just an assessment. Because if you do an assessment before you launch the operations, you can address the ready to migrate after recommended changes, you go ahead and see if you can make those changes ahead of time. The ones that you cannot migrate, it will specify why. And if any of those can be addressed, there's an opportunity to do so. In some cases, you might have to uh, export and import or do some other form of manual relocation of it, but it will tell you why prior to performing the migration. I found out a few times myself in the middle of the migration. You get 70% of the way through and then it would tell you that there's an error. Nice thing about migrations is it doesn't actually, until the very end, do anything to the original virtual machine. It's really just copying. It's copying what you've got on, on VMware into your Hyper-V. So if something goes wrong, you can just keep using the one that you've got. It's not until the end of the migration when it's actively running it up on the target that it decommissions it on the source. How do you get this? How do you get from VMware to Hyper-V? Well, there's a conversion tool built right into uh, the Virtual Machine Manager. It's called the Microsoft Virtual Machine Con uh, Converter, the, the MVMC. It's free. You can download it. It'll convert your VMs from uh, Hyper-V, I'm sorry, from VMware to Hyper-V 08 R2 and 2012. You have to be at least 08 R2. If you just got your 08 boxes out there, they can't be targets for this. It's scriptable. So if you've got, say, a couple hundred or a couple thousand virtual machines on VMware, many of them are probably going to be very similar or identical. If you know what those are, you can configure and script them, and this automates this, makes it a lot easier. It supports uh, 03, SP2, 08, 08, R2, along with Vista and Windows 7. That's for the, the machines that it's migrating. It's a clean migration, too. It snapshots the virtual machine, removes the VMware tools, because the VMware tools are incompatible with the Hyper-V integration tools. So it removes the VMware tools, converts, and then installs those integration tools back on. The integration tools or integration services are the things that allow the Hyper-V host and the virtual machine to collaborate and share resources, things like access to the clock, um, faster network capability, the ability to integrate mouse operations in and out of the virtual machines. All of that's handled through the integration tools. So the migration tool will help you through all of this. It's really quite effective. I've had it work for me, I would say, about probably 90% of the time, with the 10% of the time that it didn't work, almost always the result of a non-standard virtual machine configuration. And they're out there, you're going to run into them, you'll run into them in your environment, and they'll require some sort of manual mitigation, but they will be the exception, not the rule. You can automate this. It's scaled using the Migration Automation Toolkit. Really what it is is it's a bunch of PowerShell scripts that work with the Microsoft Virtual Machine Converter. This way, once you've figured out, like I said, you're probably going to have hundreds of virtual machines to move, maybe thousands, and they, they'll fall into certain categories. Well, once you figure out how to move one of those categories, like, say, a salesperson's virtualized desktop, then you can script that and use that series of commands to migrate the rest of the salespeople's virtualized desktops. 
It's free to download, edit, and customize. It uses SQL Express. It has to have a database because it's going to be moving so many and migrating so many of these virtual machines that to keep track of it, you need a database for it. So it uses SQL Express to do this. You can support multiple conversions at the same time per Microsoft Virtual Machine Converters. So you'll have the MVMC running on a machine. The more of those machines that you have, the more simultaneous migrations. We call these helper nodes. The more uh, uh, MVMCs that you've got running, the more simultaneous migrations you can have. This is very useful because for some of my larger customers, when they did the migration, in order for it to have minimal impact on the users, the migration had to happen within a narrow window of time. We needed to get everybody off of one platform and onto the other platform. Sometimes we'll even try to do this during a long holiday, like the Christmas to New Year's holiday we just had. If you've got a three-day weekend and you want to try and get all of this stuff done before everybody comes back on Monday, you're going to need to automate this as much as possible. And you're going to need multiple helper nodes if you've got a lot of machines to migrate. But this can all, all be automated and scaled out. More helper nodes means more simultaneous conversions. Right, so that's Hyper-V migration. We've covered, this morning we covered clustering and resiliency. That's uh, building clusters and making things highly available. We covered mobility, talking about the different migration options, live migration, storage migration, shared nothing migration. We talked about replication, which is like having a cluster without the cluster and doesn't require cluster class of hardware. We covered private clouds including the ability to host multi-tenancy and hybrid cloud configurations. And we also covered VMware management integration and migration. That's the material that I had to present to you this morning. I now would like to open it up to questions and answers. Does anybody have a question I might be able to elaborate on? I'm getting a little link indicator. Which one is this? We're going to have Gary Valentine talk about uh, Quick Start and show some of our classes that we offer. And then um, if anybody does have any questions while Gary is presenting for Charlie or Gary, go ahead and ask them in the message box, and they'll get to them. All right. So is that, is that what I needed to do? Yeah. Um, so... Charlie, if you could stop sharing so Gary can go ahead and start sharing his screen, that would be fantastic. There you go. Consider it done. Thank you. You're welcome, and I'm muting my mic now. Fantastic. Thank you. you okay. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed Charlie's presentation. I think he did a very good job, and uh, really appreciate that, Charlie. Uh, my name is Gary Ballantyne. I'm one of the uh, sales managers here for Quick Start. I want to talk to you briefly in regards to some of the class offerings that we have that would pertain to Charlie's presentation today. On our website, you can go to our Hyper-V section for IT training, and you're going to see three classes that we currently have offered for the 2012 version. Uh, the first class we have that we offer is the MS20416, and that is the desktop application environment. Here you can see we've got a couple date offerings between February and June, and a little bit about the prerequisites on the class and what you're going to gain in the class. This class is really for the enterprise customer, large entities. Um, you do definitely need the Windows Server 2012 skills. Uh, having some prerequisites of taking the basic, the 410, 411, and 412 classes. Um, this does help to prepare you for the 70-416 uh, uh, exam as you move forward. Another class that we are offering is the uh, 55021. That's the Configuring and Administering Hyper-V in 2012. And uh, that class, again, is specific for the Windows Server 2012 version. Some of the prerequisites 
are more of the uh, experience of virtualization technologies, uh, some capabilities of PowerShell as well, and then uh, just a little bit of experience with Hyper-V. The last class offering that we have currently on the 2012 version is the MS20409, and that is a brand new class, and that it pertains specifically uh, to the Windows Server 2012 R2 and the System Center 2012 R2. So this class is, again, very new. It's come out. Some of the prerequisites, again, are understandings of TCP IP and PowerShell and a little bit of understanding of uh, Hyper-V or virtualization. Um, if you have any specific needs or questions in regards to these class offerings, what you would obtain and gain at the end of the classes, please feel free to contact your account manager. Uh, if you don't know who your account manager is, we have our phone number in the top right-hand corner of our website. Uh, that's 888-501-0969. And uh, we can definitely help you with that. The last thing I wanted to speak to you about is if you do have an interest in taking the um, MS20409, which is the server virtualization with Windows Server Hyper-V and System Center class, you will get a, uh, a free test voucher towards the 74-409 exam from Microsoft. And with that being said, is there any uh, questions that anybody might have in regards uh, to this. I'm all good to go, Brittany, unless anybody has any questions for myself or Charlie. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it open um, for another minute or so. Um, if anybody does have any questions, go ahead and answer it in the message box. I'll wait about another minute, um, and then after that, it'll be concluded. So if anybody does have any questions, please ask now. Okay, well, perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, like I said, you'll be getting the recording of this webinar once you fill out the survey, and that'll be emailed to you um, in the next couple days, so please look out for that. Um, oh, Gary, it looks like there's a question from Alex. Any discount vouchers? You want to go ahead and answer that? Gary? Um, Alex, you may have dropped off. Um, nope, I'm here. Oh. I, oh, okay. I think you muted me again. By me. Oh. Okay, uh, I apologize. Um, yes, uh, there, there's a couple ways you can get a discount. One is if you have a uh, Microsoft agreement, uh, we do take their vouchers. And so uh, that is the first way. All three of those classes do take the vouchers from Microsoft. Second way is we do have some promotions that we are running where we have some uh, buy one, get one half off, or buy two classes, get one free. And again, one of your account managers uh, can talk to you in more detail about the specifics on those deals. Um, I hope that answers your question. Perfect. Looks like it did. Okay. Okay. Well, if anybody does have any extra questions um, after we do conclude, then um, feel free to email myself or Quick Start, or if you do you know your account manager, then um, they'll be able to answer any questions as well. So I just want to thank Gary and Charlie, especially for everything that he presented and for everyone who attended. That concludes the webinar. Thanks, guys.